The Vatican has released a new document this week, and it's titled Dignitatis Infinitas. It's infinite dignity. Here it is right here, Dignitatis Infinita. And it's on human dignity, and there's some good stuff in it, all right? I'm going to talk today philosophically about the concept of infinite dignity and whether created human persons can have an infinite attribute. That's today's show. So today we're going to be talking about philosophy, metaphysics, a little bit of theology as well. I'm going to look at some of the really good points of this document. For example, it's teaching on euthanasia, surrogacy, the A word, people with disabilities, um, even some interesting things to talk about transgender surgery. So all this stuff is in there. Um, and a lot of people are saying, you know, this is a win. You know, a lot of the sort of the culture of death talking points are directly addressed by this document. And we're going to look at that today, but we're also going to look at this philosophical conundrum of what it means to have infinite dignity. Do I have infinite dignity? Do you have infinite dignity? Um, how does that relate to the Blessed Trinity, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit? How does it relate to the Virgin Mary, saints, heaven, hell? Does Satan have infinite dignity? Do demons have infinite dignity? So these are all things that we're going to be discussing today. So let's look at the opening of this document. And what they did is they used a quote from Pope John Paul II. And that quote is right here. All right. This dignity of every human being can be understood as infinite, dignitas infini infinita, as Pope St. John Paul II affirmed in a meeting for people living with various limitations or disabilities. He said this to show how human dignity transcends outward appearances and specific aspects of people's life. All right, so we're going to come back to this. Before we do, I, I, I will say this. It was very smart of them by putting this forward to couch it in the language of John Paul II. This way... There could be no neoconservative resistance to the document. All right, let's look at some of the interesting, good elements. All right, talking about indelible image of God. That's great. And by the way, if, if I were writing this document, I would major on the language of image and likeness of God. It is in the document. Okay, so great. But the, the concept of infinite dignity is not necessarily a biblical term, attribute. It's not really in the church fathers. It's kind of a, a newer way of speaking. Not saying straight off the bat because it's a newer way of speaking, it's wrong, but I think we should understand that. So we do have the image of God, and then we also talk about how the second person of the Trinity, this is the next paragraph right here. Oh, let me show it to you. So here's the, here's the image of God. The first conviction drawn from Revelation holds that the dignity of every human person comes from the love of the Creator who has imprinted indelible features of His image on every person. Amen and amen. That's absolutely true. The Creator calls each person to know Him, to love Him, and to live in covenantal relationship with Him while calling the person also to live in fraternity, justice, and peace with all others. In this perspective, dignity refers not only to the soul, but also as the person as an inseparable unity of body and soul. Accordingly, dignity is also inherent in each person's body, which participates in its own way in being in imago dei, in the image of God, and is also called to share in the soul's glory in divine beatitude. Then it talks about Christ eleva elevates human dignity. Why? Because the second person of the Trinity did not become a chimpanzee, a rhinoceros, a squirrel, or a cat. The second person in Trinity assumed a full human nature, body, intellect, soul, blood, even a will. 
Christ assumes a full human nature, and that's what we see taught in the first seven ecumenical councils. There's all kinds of errors and heresies when it comes to these things. For example, Arius taught that Christ was not fully God. Nestorius taught that there were really two Christ, human Christ, divine Christ. That was condemned. The Monophysites, Eutyches, taught that he was fully God, but not fully human. The the Monothelites taught that Christ didn't have a, a, a soul, a free will. I'm sorry, didn't have a free will, and a human will, as long, along with a divine will. That was condemned as well. Sixth ecumenical council. Or was it the fifth? Fifth or sixth. And then the seventh talked about how we can make images or icons of Christ because he was truly and fully human. So all that's hammered out from... 325, Council of Nicaea, to 787, Second Council of Nicaea. That's this patristic battle for the full divinity and the full humanity of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so by becoming human, he does elevate human nature. Angels, St. Paul says, look into this mystery, and they're in awe that the second person of the Holy Trinity would assume a full human nature. All right, now let's go into some of these positive elements. Before we tackle the question, do we have infinite dignity and in how sin, particularly mortal sin, does it reduce our dignity or not? That's what we're going to tackle today. But again, some of the, the good elements here, just so people say, oh, you know, Marshall's just trying to bash everything in the Vatican. No, no. There's some good stuff here, all right? Poverty, war, migrants, human trafficking, paragraph 41 and 42. Sexual abuse is tackled in paragraph 43. Violence against women, 44 through 46. The A word, abortion, in 40, chapter 47. I was really happy in, ch in uh, chapter heading number 48, we have surrogacy. You know, a lot of so-called conservatives, a lot of Christians, a lot of Protestants, even Catholics, are saying it's totally fine to rent out a womb and have a child there and then take that child as your own. We're not talking about adoption here. We're talking about renting or paying for a womb. And, and paragraph chapter head 49 says, first and foremost, the practice of surrogacy violates the dignity of the child. Indeed, every child possesses an intangible dignity that is clearly expressed, albeit in a unique and differentiated way, at every stage of his or her life, from the moment of conception, at birth, growing up as a boy or girl, and becoming an adult, and so on. Then we have paragraph 51 and 52, euthanasia, assisted suicide, and then marginalization of people with disabilities. Gender theory actually against surgeries here on, on paragraph 60 for sex change digital violence, and then finally, the conclusion. So a lot of the social ills, confusion, sins, problems of our time are addressed directly in this document. So what is concerning here? The concern here is the concept of infinite dignity. And I will say there's, there is a point here where they do sort of soften what they mean by infinite dignity, and it is found in paragraph six. Let me just make sure that that's is it six. Yeah, okay. From the start of his pontificate, Pope Francis invited the church to believe in a father who loves all men and women with an infinite love, realizing that he thereby confers upon them an infinite dignity, end quote. He has strongly emphasized that such immense dignity is an original datum. That's Latin for, it's the singular for data, right? It's something given. That original datum, that is so acknowledged faithfully and welcomed with gratitude. 
Based on this recognition and acceptance of human dignity, a new coexistence among people can be established that develops social relationships in the context of authentic fraternity. Indeed, only by acknowledged, acknowledging the dignity of each human person can we contribute to the rebirth of a universal aspiration to fraternity. Pope Francis affirmed that the wellspring of human dignity and fraternity is in the gospel of Jesus Christ. But even human reason can arrive at this conviction through reflection and dialogue, since the dignity of others is to be respected in all circumstances, not because that dignity is something we have invented or imagined, but because human beings possess an intrinsic worth superior to that of material objects and contingent situations. That's paragraph six. Now, what's interesting here in paragraph six is that it says that God has an infinite love for us. And so that confers upon persons, people, an infinite dignity in them. Now, this philosophically can help us with this conundrum because let's just take me, for example. All right, Taylor Marshall. I'm a person. I was conceived and born in original sin. I've committed venial sins. I've committed mortal sins. I go to the sacrament of confession. I've been baptized. I go to the sacrament of confession, penance. I receive the Holy Eucharist. Um, I try to my best of ability with the help of God's grace to be a disciple of Jesus Christ and to follow and do everything that he teaches as it has been preserved for 2,000 years in the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. All right. That being said, do I, before baptism or even after baptism, have infinite dignity? Infinite dignity. And here's the problem philosophically. All right, I have a PhD in philosophy, and so to me, this is what stands out as a big problem. And I'm going to suggest a way for a workaround, but it's still a problem. All right, and that is created creatures, persons like you and like me, we don't have infinite attributes, right? So with God, we say he's omniscient, right? He's infinitely knowing. There's nothing he does not know. He even knows contingents. We say God is omnipotent. He's all powerful, right? His power is infinite. There's no limit to his knowledge, his power, even his benevolence, omnibenevolence. He's all good. There is no darkness, no sin, no malice, no evil in God. He is all good. He's true. There's no lies. He's all beautiful. There's no ugliness. So all of this is infinite in God. Why? Because God is infinite. His essence is not finite. In Latin, we have the word finis, which means boundary, right? When you finish a book, the English word finish with the H on the end actually comes from the Latin word finis, right? It means end, terminus. So if something is infinite, it's like a book that has no finish, a story that has no finish. But even more so, it goes into the future and it goes into the past infinitely. And so when we talk about the attributes of God, and I do this at the New St. Thomas Institute, if you want to become a student, check out nsti.com, New St. Thomas Institute. We do a whole course lesson in New St. Thomas Institute where we talk about the attributes of God. And when we talk about the attributes of God, we talk about the infinitude of God. So that being said, you know, Taylor Marshall was, was, born, was conceived in 1977, born in 1978. I have a beginning. I'm going to die. And I, all my attributes, everything about me, good and bad, is finite. It's not infinite. Why? Because I am not God. Now, through we Catholics believe, through the process of theosis, deification, the infusion of God's sanctifying grace, the divine life of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, through faith and baptism, 
is infused into the human person, into the soul. Even their bodies are consecrated as temples of the Holy Spirit because we invite the Holy Spirit to indwell in us. This is what baptism initiates confirmation, brings it to a perfection. Receiving the Eucharist is also an increase in that grace. If we fall into mortal sin, we have to reestablish that grace. And how is that accomplished? Through the sacrament of penance. And that grace that is within us is called sanctifying grace or habitual grace. That is a participation, says St. Peter, in the divine life, which is infinite. All right, so the only way that we finite creatures can say that we participate in an infinite reality, in this case, the habit of sanctifying grace, is through grace. We can't say that we have an infinite attribute by the sole fact of being created, by having human nature. Does that make sense? Just because you're born or you're conceived and you are born, do you have an infinite attribute called dignity that's inherent in you? St. Thomas Aquinas would have a problem with this. Most scholastic theologians, philosophers are going to have a problem with this because what it's insinuating incorrectly, people could wrongly understand this, is that we are all tiny droplets of God. There's an ocean of water, and then every once in a while there's a spray on the beach, and all these little drops land on the sand or go into the air and become raindrops. And then over time, all of that accumulates and it rains back into the ocean and it returns to the ocean. So this is kind of a Gnostic or New Age understanding of what a human person is, that we're little droplets from the ocean, from a big body of water, which is called God. We are tiny droplets of God, little pieces of broken off divine essence, lesser lights, and we break off from the ocean, and then we eventually come back to the ocean. And if that were the case, by the way, Catholicism does not teach that. But if that were the case, then we might be able to say we have an infinite dignity because we would be little droplets of God, broken off and then returning. In fact, I once heard a diocesan priest preach a sermon so many years ago, and said, here is Catholicism. We were all with God, and then we went out of God, and then at the end, all of us will return back to God. My friends, that is not Catholicism. That is Neoplatonism. That is Gnosticism. That is something akin to what Origen taught. It is something that Oprah Winfrey believes and teaches, that we are sparks from God that go back to God or droplets from God that go back. And if that were the case, we would have some claim on being infinite. And in a way, you really wouldn't, because once you leave the infinite mass of the ocean, you would now become a finite droplet. So even then, your infinitude would cease for a moment, and then it would have to go back. You see the problem here? Philosophically, Infinite attributes posited to human persons are a major problem. The only way we Catholics understand that is by our participation in the divine nature through grace, which Thomas Aquinas says, then when we reach the beatific vision through a light and illumination, we will be united. He even says we will become deiform, we will be united to the divine essence, and that's called the beatific vision. We won't comprehend God. We will see God, but we will not be able to comprehend all of God. Why? Because God is infinite, and we are finite. So we will not be able to comprehend God as God comprehends himself. Even in heaven, 
our finitude will be there. Otherwise, we would just be fully absorbed into the divine essence and we would cease to exist. That's kind of a Hindu or Buddhist nirvana idea that we would be absorbed back into God. But no, as Catholics, as Christians, we believe that we retain our personhood in heaven forever. So although we have the beatific vision, we are united to God. I will still be who I am and you will still be who you are, God willing, if we get to heaven. So that's the concept here of infinite attributes for human persons. And, you know, if we look at the document, let me go back to the document here. Pope Francis kind of has some wiggle room here. In, in, in chapter heading six, he says, the father loves men and women with an infinite love, realizing that he thereby confers upon them an infinite dignity, end quote. So this is the wiggle room. God has infinite love. And so by infinitely loving me and infinitely loving you, that sort of places upon us an infinite worth or an infinite dignity. And that's the wiggle room there, right? So you're saying that the infinite dignity is not, or it's not co-natural or original with each human person. Rather, it's, it's more like a reflection in a mirror of the infinite love of God reflected in humans as infinite dignity. That right there would be a way to rescue this concept, all right? That would be, but I think, unfortunately, like many of these documents, because there's ambiguity in it, it's going to be used not in that precise philosophical way that I just explained. It's going to be used to say, well, no matter how sinful or what you do in this life, you have an infinite dignity and therefore, all of the rules, all of the standards of moral conduct will not in any way exclude you or punish you. So it will ultimately lead to sort of a von Balthasar conclusion that since everyone has infinite dignity, everyone will have infinite bliss in heaven. That's the trajectory for which this will be used in talking points for sermons and homilies for years and years to come. Now let's talk about dignity and sin. So if you read the Eastern Church Fathers, the Western Church Fathers, particularly the Eastern Church Fathers, there is the idea that we were made in the image and likeness of God. And that through sin, the first sin of Adam and Eve, and also the sins that each one of us commit, we begin to attack that image of God in us. We cannot blur it out. We cannot remove it. You could commit a thousand murders, a thousand Name a, name a nasty sin over and over and over, and you would never be able to obliterate the image of God in you. You would begin to mar it and deface it, but you would never fully be able to obliterate the image of God in your nature because God set it there. That being the case, the Catholic Church, Eastern Fathers and the Western Fathers, the Eastern Fathers especially talk about how sin injures and harms the likeness of God. So the image of God is there. The likeness of God, right, is defaced. And Christ comes, assumes human nature, fully God, fully man. He deifies human nature. And he opens the way to restore the image and the likeness of God in human purses. Here's the key. Through the incarnate Jesus Christ. So whether we use the word dignity, whether we use the word image of God, see, I would like to use the word image of God. And the document does use that. 
But when we get to dignity, you know, the, the word dignity, just like the word cool in English right now, is slippery. You're like, oh, it's cool outside. Or those sneakers are cool. You know, or that jacket is cool. Is it not warm enough? No, it just looks cool. It's, it looks good. Dignity has the same kind of, you know, like, I answered her with dignity. You know, or he's, he's an older man with a lot of dignity. You know, a dignity doesn't always necessarily mean philosophically what we're talking about in this document. Whereas image and likeness of God is a pretty strong, canonized Christian term that 99% of Christians and even non-Christians understand what we talk about when we talk about image of God. But infinite dignity almost makes it sound like this erroneous concept in Karl Rahner. Karl Rahner was an architect, not the architect, but one of the architects of the Second Vatican Council. And Karl Rahner talked about, and I covered this in my, my PhD dissertation. My dissertation was titled St. Thomas Aquinas on Natural Law and the Twofold End of Humanity. And I talk a lot about whether human nature has within it an innate desire for God or whether that desire for God is elicited and human capability of understanding whether God exists on sit Deus versus what God is, quid Deus est. This is, this is my specialty. This is what I spent years studying. And it relates to this topic as well because Karl Rahner, and I cover my dissertation, he posits something similar to infinite dignity. It's a transcendence that is in human nature, that while they're created, while humans are finite, they have this sort of peculiar openness to the divine, and God made them that way. And so this transcendent is always looking for God, longing for God, innately, naturally desiring God. And Karl Rahner uses this as the basis for anonymous Christianity. He says, anytime any, any human in the world, atheist, Hindu, Buddhist, Jewish, Muslim, Christian, Catholic, uh, Aboriginal, local, tribal religion, has sort of this transcendent longing openness, whether they even say the word God or monotheism, anytime they have that, they are grasping and, and, and embracing the one true God. And from that teaching, Karl Rahner goes on to talk about anonymous Christians. He says, you know, there's a Hindu somewhere in India, every time he's worshiping Shiva, he's just open to the transcendent, you know, maybe me. He's saying the Hare Krishna or whatever. And, and when he does that, he's just so open, but he thinks he's worshiping Krishna, but in reality, he's hugging and embracing Christ. So while he says, I'm not a Christian, I'm a Hindu, or I worship Shiva or Krishna or Shiva or whatever, Karl Rahner would say he's an anonymous Christian. In reality, when he's bowing down to the idol of Krishna, he's bowing down to Christ. And he says, this is how all these people in the world are saved, is anonymous Christianity, because Karl Rahner understands human nature as possessing this openness to the transcendence. And so any movement towards a transcendence is, for him, a movement to God. And a movement to God is salvific, right? The person is saved without baptism, without accepting Jesus Christ as his personal Lord and Savior, without going to Mass or confession or reciting the Apostles' Creed or the Nicene Creed. In a nutshell, that's Karl Rahner. And, and what I'm kind of, and I know that Cardinal Fernandez and Pope Francis Bergoglio as Jesuits were drinking heavily of Karl Rahner. And this was definitely the theology they received in their seminary formation. That is, human nature has its open transcendence. Well, 
What does St. Thomas Aquinas teach on this? Well, I wrote 600 pages on it. In a nutshell, Thomas Aquinas teaches that there's not, and, and by the way, De Lubach and all the Nouvelle Tales you guys do not agree with, have an innate natural desire for God. We are not made with sort of this open transcendence. However, by, ha by being made in the image and likeness of God, with an intellect, with a will, and with the ability to observe creation in the universe, Romans chapter 1, what happens is, by using our intellect, we look at the Grand Canyon, we look at the Milky Way, we think about moral standards, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery. We look at the order of the human eyeball or, you know, a solar eclipse. And, f and that sense of awe, Thomas Aquinas uses the word admiratio. In Latin, it's like looking at something with amazement. In English, it's admiration, but in, in Latin, it's more like Odd means towards, and mira is just sort of looking, gazing. From that admiratio, the sense of awe and wonder, the human naturally is elicited, drawn out to say, somebody made this. Some, someone did this. Who is this? What is this? What is this prime mover which is the language of Aristotle, or to use the language of Socrates and Plato, what is this form of goodness, the form of the good that brought this beauty and this truth and goodness? And, and so what happens is, is because we're in the image of God and we have intellects and will, our desire for God is elicited through this process of awe. That's St. Thomas Aquinas. Why does St. Thomas Aquinas go through all the effort to understand man's desire for God in that way? The reason Thomas Aquinas does that is because he knows that if God places within a human person, innately, in nature, the desire for God, just as he puts in humans the desire to drink water to live, that God is obligated to fulfill that desire. Like he couldn't make humans that are thirsty for water and then never create water on earth. That would be cruel, evil, right? And so Thomas Aquinas' concern is he's trying to battle against Pelagianism. St. Augustine is trying to battle against Pelagianism. Pelagius was a monk who said, you know, we innately have grace. When you're conceived and born and coming Lord, you have grace in you. You don't need to be baptized as an infant. You have grace in you. And if you live according to this grace in you, you will go to heaven. You don't need sacraments, right? That's Pelagius. And he, because he sees human nature and grace as together. They come together. God creates you with grace. St. Augustine, the church fathers rejected that as heretical. So Thomas Aquinas is avoiding that error, and so he wants to say that we are made with human nature, and that human nature is drawn out and it, it, through an elicitation by wonder and looking at the world. We come to desire, we come to want God. But it's not because there is a, a tractor beam inside the human heart going... And it's just locking onto God, whether you're a Hindu or whatever. No, there is this process of elicitation where God is drawing you to contemplate creation, contemplate the creator. And you're like, wow, I would like to know him. I would like to know more about him, right? And this is where you get to the level of monotheist, right? And then beyond that, you be, get to the level of Christian, where you realize God is Father, Son, Holy Ghost. This happens through missionary work, preaching, evangelization. This is why Jesus says, go into all nations, not some nations, not European nations, not Middle Eastern nations. Go into all nations, proclaiming 
everything that I have taught you and baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. And once you get to baptism and acceptance of the gospel, now we have sanctifying grace. And now you could say that humans are participating by grace and eventually by glory in the divine nature. And that is something infinite. So that is the Thomistic classical understanding. I'm convinced, I'm 100% convinced that in this document with Cardinal Fernandez and Pope Francis Bergoglio, we are getting the Karl Rahner understanding of human nature, which is one degree away from Pelagianism. And if you read the Vatican document on world religions, you see this Karl Rahner understanding of human nature, that there's something, there's something already transcendental, somebody, something already grace-filled, or here we would say something already infinite in human nature before there is faith, before there is love, before there is gospel, before there is sacraments. And that's not a traditional Christian understanding. If you're learning something, please subscribe. Also, tonight I will be hosting a webinar. It's sponsored by the New St. Thomas Institute, and we are going to look at the three main objections against Catholicism, sacramental objections. Number one, why do you believe in the Eucharist? You believe bread and wine becomes the body and blood of Jesus, and then you want to eat that? That's cannibalism. You shouldn't be doing that. So we're going to look at that objection. I'm going to give you a very specific way for you to answer that objection. I'm going to give you resources, worksheets, almost like a script. All right, the second thing we're going to cover tonight is why do you confess your sins to a priest when you can confess them straight to Jesus? Very common objection to Catholicism. There's a very good answer. It has to do with Christ's resurrection, John chapter 20. I'm going to give you the Bible verses, the resources. So for the rest of your life, when you hear that, you are going to have a one to three minute response that is going to be biblical, reasonable, historical, traditional, everything you need. And then tonight, and by the way, the link for tonight's webinar is below me uh, on YouTube here. The third one is why do you baptize babies? And that kind of touches on today's topic. If babies are born with the infinite already in them, with divine grace, with transcendence, why would you baptize a baby? They're good to go. Traditional Catholic teaching holds that there is something wrong in the spiritual well-being of that infant, of that infant, and therefore we need to remedy that by conferring the sacrament of faith of initiation on that child. So tonight I'm going to walk y'all through from a traditional point of view: How do you defend the Eucharist? How do you defend, defend confessing sins to priests? And how do you confess? How do you defend baptizing infants? And you are going to be confident. We're going to have fun. I imagine there's going to be thousands of people with us live. Last time we did this, I think we had 3,000 people. A webinar is kind of like YouTube, but I can it's more like a Zoom call with me. And I'm able to talk to you and take questions and give you PDFs and give you books and free stuff. So below me right now on YouTube is the link. If the moderators could also share that link, I would really appreciate it. Let me see if I can share real quick. And join us for the webinar tonight. There it is. I just, I just added it to the live chat. Joe, if you could maybe pin that or show that to people, it's a webinar tonight. So I would take some comments and questions now, but I think tonight in the webinar would be a great time to discuss these topics because really what we're talking about here is, yes, man has dignity, sin mars dignity, and then the solution is not an appeal traditionally or in Thomas Aquinas, or in Augustine. The solution's not an appeal to, well, you have infinite dignity. The solution is Jesus Christ is the infinite, co-eternal, consubstantial Son of the Father. He took human flesh. He became man. The Word became flesh and dwelt amongst us, and He died for your sins. And that right there elevates the dignity of Mary Magdalene. It elevates the dignity of the thief on the cross. It elevates the dignity of St. Peter after he denied him thrice. 
I don't see in the Acts of the Apostles or in the Epistles an appeal to raw human nature dignity as a solution for human brokenness. I'm not saying that every, by the way, let me just say this. Every human person has dignity by being made in the image and likeness of God. Muslims are made in the image and likeness of God. Jews, Buddhists, atheists, Muslims, every single person, brand new procreated embryos, sperm and egg come together, human dignity, human dignity, and we cannot torture one another, we cannot curse one another, we cannot abuse one another. That human dignity in the image of likeness of God stands and it is real. The problem is, because of original sin, because of concupiscence, we are violating and injuring our own dignity and the dignity of other people. The biblical, the traditional, the church fathers, the patristic, the Catholic answer to this horrible problem is Jesus. He restores us. This is why the the veil in the temple was torn bottom, top to bottom, right? Because he reopens our way back into paradise, back into the Garden of Eden. He restores us. So, you, you, you know, Christ and Peter and John didn't go to the rabbis and the Pharisees and the scribes and the high priests and say, you have, you have infinite dignity. Just embrace your infinite dignity. They didn't go to the Greeks and the Romans and the Syrians and the North Africans and say, you have infinite dignity. Embrace your infinite dignity. They said, repent and believe on Jesus Christ. Be baptized. Come be part of our universal community, the Catholic Church. Learn what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, and that will restore your dignity. All right, join us tonight. We have a great webinar, and it's going to be awesome. It's going to be live. We're going to talk about Eucharist, how to defend the Eucharist, how to defend confessing your sins to a priest, how to defend infant baptism, which relates to today's topic. You can Live chat, click the link. You can also, in the show notes below, click that link. Make sure, oh, you do have to, it's free, doesn't cost anything, but you do have to register and save your spot. So please click the link, register, save your spot. You'll get an email and you'll be able to join us tonight. So you have to register a spot to be part. All right, and it will not be here on YouTube, right? It's gonna be a webinar. So you have to click the link and register. All right, well, let's pray together. We'll pray the Our Father, which is a prayer of dignity. It's uniting us to the love of the Father. Oremos. Nomini Patris et Fidei et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Pater Noster, qui est in celi, sanctificetur nomen tuum, adveniat regnum tuum, fiat voluntas tua, sicut in cello et in terra. Panem nostrum quotidianum da nobis hodie, et imite nobis debita nostra, sicut et nos dimitimus debitoribus nostris, et ne nos inducas in tentationem, Se libra nos amalo. Amen. Nomini Patris et Fidi et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Thanks, everybody, for watching. If uh, you want to go deeper and look into the attributes of God, study St. Thomas Aquinas. I have a whole course on the philosophy of Thomas Aquinas. I have modules on St. Augustine and the Pelagian controversy, the Church Fathers. I have courses on, on all of the first seven councils, ecumenical councils of the Church, So if you want to say church history, Bible, any of those things, go to nsti.com, New St. Thomas Institute, nsti.com. We have 10 courses. You can earn your certificate in Catholic philosophy, in Catholic theology, in church history, in Old Testament, New Testament. It's all there. Go to nsti.com, New St. Thomas Institute, and we have all kinds of resources, courses, everything is there in the cloud. So check it out, nsti.com. And of course, join us for our webinar tonight, sponsored by New St. Thomas Institute. But make sure you reserve your spot and click the link and join us tonight. All right, so I'll see y'all this evening. You do have dignity. God loves you with an infinite love, and he desires for you to be with him in heaven forever. And the way 
to that reality is Jesus Christ, it's baptism, it's faith, it's love, it's forgiveness, it's mercy, it's very beautiful. And remember, our Lord Jesus Christ says, you're the light of the world and the salt of the earth. So go out there and be salty. God bless and Godspeed.